All right. I'm Professor Van Norden. This is Neo-Confucianism and Chinese Buddhism. And uh, in this lecture, we're going to be talking about the rise of Neo-Confucianism in China. And it's impossible to talk about that with explain without explaining the decline of Buddhism in China. So we'll start by talking about that. Uh, my opening music was a performance on a guqin, which is a kind of ancient zither that was known even in the time of Confucius, and Confucius probably played it. There's not too many people who actually play uh, guqin today. There are people who play um, instruments that are related to it, that have a lot of influence on the development of musical instruments in China. But it's, it's rare to find people who genuinely play the guqin, but our opening music was a guqin per, uh, piece played by John Thompson. But let's turn then to the topic of today's lecture, still admitting people, no problem, admitting people from the waiting room. So this is the Faman Temple, which still exists in Shanxi province in China. And it was one of the uh, earlier major temples in China. It was probably founded in the Six Dynasties period, which was that period of comparative chaos after the fall of the Han Dynasty, when Buddhism became increasingly popular and influential. And by the time order was restored in the Sui Dynasty, and then especially in the Tang Dynasty, which lasted from 618 to 906 in the Common Era, Buddhism was extremely influential. Buddhism had a lot of social prestige. It had a lot of political power and Buddhist monasteries controlled a lot of wealth. So is a, and you can illustrate these things with the figure of Fa Zong, whom you might remember as the author of several important philosophical works in Hua Yan Buddhism. We talked about him in an earlier lecture. Fa Zong wrote the Rafter Dialogue, an essay on the Golden Lion. And the essay on the Golden Lion was inspired by a talk that Fa Zong gave to Empress Wu Zetian, the only empress to uh, rule in her own right, um, in her own name in Chinese history. And the fact that Fadzong was being invited to the royal palace to give lectures on Buddhism reflects the great prestige that Buddhism had. But we also know that Fadzong was politically involved in the machinations which led to Empress Wu Zetian gaining the throne. And this reflects the fact that Buddhists had become very influential in political circles and very influential at court. In addition, Buddhist monasteries controlled a lot of wealth. Like religious institutions in the West, Buddhist monasteries were tax exempt. Um, because they uh, officially, ironically, officially because they'd taken vows of poverty, when they did produce things like grain, sometimes they had more grain than they knew what to do with. And then they would end up loaning that grain out at interest to farmers. And of course, people would make donations to the monasteries to gain merit. And so the monasteries ended up controlling a lot of gold and silver as well. So by the time you get to the Tang Dynasty, many Buddhist monasteries are extremely wealthy. They control huge amounts of land. They lend, they lend money out at interest. And something similar later happened in Japan. And it's part of what the Japanese Zen Buddhist philosopher Ikkyu was arguing against in his own era in Japan. But, and there's a similar problem today where, and you, this isn't a problem unique to Buddhism, you find this in institutions around the world. The institutions often find ways of making money and then they become more about making money than they are about doing what they're supposed to be doing. This is true not just of Buddhist institutions, it's true of many Christian, Jewish, Islamic, Hindu institutions as well, of educational institutions. Some people joke that, for example, Harvard is basically <clears throat> an investment bank that has a little education thing going on the side to get a tax break. Um, that's not entirely fair to Harvard, but you know Harvard is incredibly wealthy and invests a lot of money. Likewise, a lot of these monasteries ended up being extremely wealthy. So by the in the Tang, Buddhism has reached a peak philosophically. It's reached a peak uh, institutionally in terms of wealth and power and prestige. 
And one of the indications of this is that in the year 819, the Faman Temple um, had a relic, supposedly a finger bone from the historical Buddha. And supposedly the Faman Temple still has this. And you can actually go to China and go to the Faman Temple and you know, if you pay a fee, you can uh, worship the bone, finger bone of the Buddha. Now, again, the, the use of religious relics is not unique to the Buddhist tradition. There's a rich tradition of religious relics, particularly in the Roman Catholic tradition. And so there are often things like the bone or some blood or something that belonged to a saint or a martyr, someone who died for the faith. But in the Middle Ages, people claimed to have things associated with Jesus, like they claimed to have a piece of wood from the cross on which Jesus was crucified. Uh, if you've heard of the Holy Grail, the Grail is supposedly the cup from which Jesus drank at the Last Supper, and then supposedly uh, it, had, it had some of the blood of Jesus when he was dying on the cross. So there's religious relics in, in lots of different traditions, and they're thought to have magical healing power. So supposedly the, the finger bone of the Buddha had restored sight to people who were blind or had re restored hearing to people who couldn't hear. So in 819, the reigning emperor um, asked that this relic be brought in a procession from the Faman Temple to the royal palace uh, in the, the nearby, nearby capital, which was near where Xi'an, China is today. And he was going to venerate it in the capital. And the emperor was a devout Buddhist. There were many devout Buddhists in society. So this was a very popular thing to do. One person objected very strenuously. The person who objected to bringing this, the bone of the Buddha to the palace was Han Yu, who was a Confucian scholar. And he wrote a, uh, a, a letter of protest to the emperor, and it's translated in readings in later Chinese philosophy as Memorandum on a Bone of the Buddha. Many translators render that title Memorial on a Bone of the Buddha, uh, because Memorial is a translation for a technical term in Chinese for a communication to the emperor. But we don't use the word memorial that way in ordinary English, so I translated it memorandum because that's at least closer to what this kind of document would be called in English. So Han Yu writes this memorandum on a bone of the Buddha and he, he objects strenuously in particular to bringing the bone of the Buddha to the imperial palace, but this becomes an occasion for Han Yu to object to Buddhism in general. So <clears throat> here's part of what Han Yu says. Now, the Buddha was fundamentally a barbarian. He did not understand Chinese. His clothes were in a different style. His mouth did not speak the doctrine of the former kings. His body did not wear the clothes of the former kings. He did not know of righteousness between ruler and minister or of the feelings between father and son. So a significant part of Han Yu's objection here is that the Buddha wasn't Chinese. He wasn't one of the Chinese sages. Because remember, the Buddha wasn't born in China. He was born in South Asia. And uh, Buddhism first developed in what is now India. And then it was brought by missionaries over the Silk Road to China. And so part of Han Yu's objection for sure is simply this is a foreign religion. And so the objection is to some extent xenophobic and chauvinistic. Uh, and it, the chauvinism and xenophobia really comes out in this next paragraph. If he were still alive today, the Buddha, and came on a diplomatic mission to our court, your majesty would accept him, but do nothing more than grant him an audience in the reception hall, give him a banquet, present him with a proper set of clothes, and have him escorted to the border, not allowing him to confuse the masses. And now that he's been dead for a long time, how could it be proper to let this decayed bone, this vile refuse, enter the royal palace? I plead with you to hand over this bone to an official, to be tossed into water or fire, and be completely destroyed. And now, like I say, most of these objections uh, are kind of xenophobic um, or you know, very chauvinistic, um, uh, you know, very ethnocentric. 
But we get a hint of a genuine philosophical concern here in this line that I put in boldface. The Buddha did not know of righteousness between ruler and minister or of the feelings between father and son. What Han Yu means by that is that Buddhism, by encouraging a celibate clergy and encouraging people to enter a monastery and effectively drop out of society, was turning its back on the greater culture of which it's a part. And this was a concern that people in China had had about Buddhism from the moment it came to China. Remember earlier we read uh, an essay on why Buddhist monks do not bow down before kings. And it tried to address the concern that Buddhism is antisocial. And that's, a, that's not just xenophobia. You mean you don't have to agree with it, uh, but it, it's a more substantive philosophical objection. And there were some genuine concerns that people raised about Buddhism. Consider this next line right here. So this is Han Yu warning the king that he actually, he phrases the, the memorandum very cleverly in terms of rhetoric. Han Yu says, your majesty, I know you, your majesty, are too enlightened to believe in Buddhism. I know that you're just going along with this primitive Buddhist ritual to please the common people, but it will actually have bad effects if you encourage the Buddhist superstition among the common people. Now, that was a, a good move rhetorically, but in fact, the, the emperor was an ardent Buddhist. And after reading the memorandum on a bone of the Buddha, he wanted to have Han Yu executed. However, Han Yu's criticisms of Buddhism uh, impressed many people at court who were getting fed up with the wealth and the power and the dominance of Buddhism. And as we'll see, in fairness, there were some genuine grounds for concern about what Buddhism had become as an institution. I respect Buddhist philosophy very, very much. I think that's come across in the last few lectures, just like I respect other philosophical systems like Confucianism and Taoism and Aristotelianism and Platonism and so on. But that doesn't mean we can't point out genuine social or institutional abuses or corruptions of the institutions. And uh, this Han Yu is about to point out a real problem here. So in the memorandum on a bone of the Buddha, Han Yu says, should they, the common people, see your majesty acting like this? Han Yu saying, pretending that you take Buddhism seriously. They will begin to say that you serve the Buddha with genuine feelings. They shall all say, the son of heaven is greatly sagacious and furthermore reverently faithful with his whole mind. Who are we commoners that we should begrudge serving the Buddha with our lives? Singeing their heads and burning their fingers in groups of hundreds, they will rend their clothes and give away their money from morning till night floundering around in imitation of one another, fearing only that they will be left behind, old and young running to and fro, abandoning their tasks. If this is not immediately suppressed and the bone passes from temple to temple, there will definitely be those who mortify their own flesh in the name of paying homage to it. Corrupting public morals and making ourselves ridiculous to the world like this are not insignificant matters. Now, when I first read Han Yu's essay, um, I thought, when I read this section, I said, this is really unfair. Buddhism is not about mortifying your flesh. I don't know what he's talking about when he says they would singe, burn their heads and burn their fingers. Uh, none of that has anything to do with Buddhism. I don't think it has anything to do personally with Buddhism at its best, but it turns out historically that Han Yu was actually describing real phenomena that were associated with the institutions and practices of Buddhism in his era. So I mentioned Fa Zong, uh, again, essay on the golden lion and the rafter dialogue, this great Buddhist philosopher who also was very influential at court. When he was a teenager, Fa Zong went to the Fa Mun temple, the temple that has the the supposed finger bone of the Buddha, which supposedly has magical powers, magical healing powers. And 
Fazong was so impressed that he set his own finger on fire as an offering to show his, do his devotion to the Buddha. In addition, Zong Mi, whom you'll remember, we read his um, essay on humanity. Uh, so that's, a, that's an, a really fascinating philosophical work also about Buddhism. And you remember it hierarchically organized different kinds of teachings and explained that Confucianism and Taoism were okay, but Theravadan Buddhism is better than Confucianism and Taoism and Mahayana, particularly the version of Mahayana that Tsung Mi believes in is even higher. You remember that? Talked about that in an earlier lecture. Tsung Mi gave a public lecture on Buddhism. And at this public lecture, someone cut off a piece of his own arm and gave it to Tsung Mi as an offering to show his dedication. And far from criticizing practices like that, Tsung Mi actually endorsed practices like this. And we saw that in some of the sutras, there are stories of people hacking off a limb as a way of showing their faith in Buddhism. There were some Buddhists who said, well, look, that's upaya. That's you know, telling a fanciful story to make a point. But Zong Mi argued to the contrary. He said, oh no, these are literally true and they're great ways of showing your devotion to the Buddha. So there were people who were burning themselves, cutting off parts of their body to show their dedication to the Buddha. And Han Yu says, this is just wrong. It's just unnatural. In addition, there's a tradition that goes all the way back to the Analects, the sayings of Confucius, that part of filial piety is preserving your body um, that was given to you by your parents. And so part of filial piety is, if at all possible, getting to the end of your life with your body intact. And it was considered a failure of filial piety if you mutilated your, your body. So the way that Buddhist monks and nuns cut off your hair was considered a violation of filial piety, much less burning your body or cutting part of your body off was considered a, a real violation of filial piety. And even if you're not a Confucian, I think we can see the point that these practices do seem a little unnatural and extreme. Interestingly, practices like this are still alive to some extent in the Buddhist tradition. I'll give you two examples. I watched a documentary a few years ago. Someone actually presented this documentary at Vassar, here at Vassar, and it was about contemporary Buddhist monks who choose to live by themselves in the wilderness instead of being part of a, a Buddhist temple because they want to have a more authentic Buddhist experience. And the Buddhist temples are often, you know, to some extent associated and approved by the, the Chinese government. So they wanted to have this authentic hermit experience as a Buddhist monk or nun in the wilderness. I noticed several of the monks, uh, I don't remember whether the nuns, we only saw a couple of nuns, but the, the Buddhist monks, several of them had big scars in their head. You could see them very clearly because their head shaved. And I had a guess about what that was, but to confirm it, I asked the documentarian who presented the documentary, I said, what are those scars on their heads? And he said, to show their dedication, they burn incense on their head and they let it burn all the way down until it actually burns their flesh down to the bone to show their dedication to the Buddha. Now for Confucians who emphasize finding happiness in the everyday world, this was anathema. This was really bad. Now, the next slide I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna give you a trigger warning, right? Because I'm gonna illustrate the continuing uh, existence of the practice of immolating oneself, burning oneself. And this next slide is, is a very famous photograph. It actually won the Pulitzer Prize in I think 1963 or maybe 1964 for news photography, but it's really disturbing, all right? So I'll explain the story. So if, you're not in a place right now, we're in a pandemic, people are dealing with a lot of things. If you're not in a place where you wanna see this, I will tell you and I'm about to pull the slide up and you can look away from the screen or turn video off. I'd ask if you think you can continue to listen and I'll describe why the slide is historically interesting. Um, but 
Uh, and then I'll tell you when the slide is gone. So if you wanna look back at the screen, you can. So again, trigger warning, this next slide is disturbing. Here comes the slide, I'm putting it on now. Now, Vietnam, as I pointed out several times, although geographically we tend to classify it as part of Southeast Asia, and Theravadan Buddhism is the dominant form of Buddhism in most of Southeast Asia, but Vietnam was very influenced by Mahayana Buddhism, the kind of Buddhism that developed in China and Japan and Korea and uh, uh, Tibet. And what is now Vietnam was a French colony uh, around the time of World War II. It was called French Indochina. After the war, eventually they fought for and won their independence, but Vietnam was divided into communist North Vietnam and capitalist and more US leaning South Vietnam. And of course the US Vietnam War, we ended up eventually fighting war in Vietnam, uh, helping uh, uh, fighting on the side of the, the South Vietnamese. But before the US had become substantially, like massively involved in the Vietnam War, the, the dominant people in the Vietnamese government were Roman Catholic, because remember, Vietnam had been a former French colony and there had been Catholic missionaries there. And so the dominant people in the South Vietnamese government at a certain point were Roman Catholic and they were persecuting the indigenous Buddhist population to protest the treatment of Buddhism in South Vietnam. On the 11th of June, 1963, a Buddhist monk poured gasoline all over himself and set himself on fire and he burned to death. A, some Western journalists had been tipped off that something important was going to happen. They didn't know what. And one of them was David Halberstam, who's, and he's a major journalist covering the Vietnam War. Um, and so he was there and he said it was horrifying, but also impressive because he said he didn't cry out, he didn't flinch, he just sat there while he burned to death. Uh, I believe there's also video of this if you want to see it. Again, it's as disturbing as this photograph. Um, but again, this illustrates the way some people in the Buddhist tradition interpreted detachment as involving a kind of rejection of any attachment to your physical body. So it's a very kind of extreme sort of view. Okay. The slide is now gone. The image is now gone. If you looked away, you can look back at the screen. Uh, if you turned off the, the video, you can turn the video back on. Now, of course, uh, you know, it's not just Confucians like Han Yu who would object to mortifying the flesh or self-immolation. Ikyu, the Japanese Zen Buddhist monk we talked about who said that there's nothing wrong with being enlightened and enjoying a nice drink or enjoying the pleasures of the flesh would say that people who damage their body to show dedication to the Buddha had failed to understand the true meaning of non-duality and the notion that you know one is all and all is one. So people in, some people in the Buddhist tradition would object to this as well, but I'm just saying Han Yu had identified part of his critique is simply ethnocentric chauvinism, but part of it's a genuine concern about the ways in which the institutions of Buddhism and the Tong had gotten out of control and some of the practices have gotten out of, out of control. In addition, as I hinted at before, there were economic reasons for being concerned with the institutional form that Buddhism had taken during the Tang. And this is from another essay by Han Yu on the way. He says, in ancient times, the people were composed of four groups. And his audience would know this is a reference to the four traditional classes in East Asian society, scholars, farmers, craftsmen, and merchants. And they're ordered in that, in that way. Interestingly, merchants are at the bottom of the social hierarchy in a traditional system of thought. So it says, in ancient times, there were four groups of people and Confucians were in the scholar group and they were the administrators who ran government and ran society. Nowadays, the people are composed of six groups, the original four plus Taoist priests plus Buddhist monks. So in ancient times, those who taught, you know, the scholars 
who are the intellectuals, but also the administrators in government. Those who taught occupied one of the groups. Nowadays, those who teach occupy three of the groups. For one farming household, there are six households that eat its grain. For one craftsman household, there are six households that use its implements. For one merchant household, there are six households that get goods from it. How could the people not be impoverished and resort to stealing? So in other words, there's so much wealth tied up in these tax exempt and frequently quite wealthy monasteries. And there's so many monks and nuns and then on top of that, Taoist priests who are supported by donations from others and are not productive members of society, that it's a huge economic drain. And people were aware of this in China in the Tang, and it's part of the reason that Han Yu's critique of Buddhism, um, people were very sympathetic to it. They said there really is a genuine problem here. Now, as I say, Han Yu, the emperor, was furious about his memorandum on a bone of the Buddha. He wanted to have Han Yu executed, but people spoke up in Han Yu's defense, and instead, Han Yu was just exiled rather than being executed. But he was punished by the emperor for speaking out, but a lot of people sympathized with his criticisms of Buddhism. Then, near the end of the Tang, we get to what is called the Great Persecution of Buddhism, technically known in Chinese as the Hui Chang Hui Fu. The Hui Chang is the name of the era during the reign of Emperor Wu Zung when this event took place. It's the Hui Chang Persecution of Buddhism. And it was carried out by Emperor Wu Zung. Now, based on what I've said, you might be expecting that, oh, I bet Emperor Wu Zung was persuaded by Confucians at court to persecute the Buddhists. Nope. It turns out that Emperor Wu Zung was influenced by Taoists at court. Emperor Wu Zung was a big fan of Taoism and the Taoists convinced Emperor Wu Zung that Buddhism was a dangerous, corrupt foreign religion that, and China would be better off without it. So uh, in, during the, the Hui Chang uh, persecution of Buddhism, many Buddhist monks and nuns were laicized. They were forced to become ordinary citizens and to renounce their uh, vows um, and to change their clothes and to become normal productive citizens again. Buddhist monasteries and temples, their land and their wealth was seized by the state. Um, and they were closed down. And it had a, a huge negative effect on Buddhism. Now, as you can see from the dates I've given you there, uh, uh, you can argue about exactly when it's the, this started, but the really the worst part of the persecution was 845 to 846 CE. Didn't last very long. Emperor Wu Zung died. And after he died, they ended this, the, the policies of the persecution. And of course, Buddha said, well, no wonder he died. He was punished by the gods for attacking Buddhism. Um, interestingly, it's possible that Emperor Uzung died because the Taoists that he was interacting with were giving him elixirs, potions that were supposed to give him immortality. But the fact is that some Taoist immortality potions were poisonous and they included mercury which is extremely poisonous and uh, it's possible the emperor was accidentally poisoned by the Taoists who were trying to give him immortality elixirs but in any case he died and they ended the persecution and so monasteries could reopen and monks and nuns could return to their sacred vows now buddhism does not die out at this point it continues to be influential and it's influential in china Japan, Korea, uh, Vietnam today, but it never really recovered from this persecution in the sense that the philosophical uh, power of the Buddhist tradition and the level of power and prestige and wealth that Buddhism had at the peak of the Tang dynasty, it never got back to, but it, but it continued to be an influential social force. And in the kind of intellectual vacuum where uh, Buddhism had been partially eliminated, you have the rise of the movement that we know in the West 
as Neo-Confucianism. So what is Neo-Confucianism? Well, it's a little disappointing in a way because Neo-Confucianism is not a direct translation of any term in the original Chinese. You could express Neo-Confucianism in Chinese if you wanted to, but that's not what people say in Chinese. However, the phrase Neo-Confucianism has become the stock way of referring to this movement in English. So I considered at points in my careers just you know, holding out on this and just saying, no, I won't use the term Neo-Confucianism because it's kind of a misleading term, but it's just so common, it's almost inevitable that we use it now. So, it, it, but, but what is this thing called Neo-Confucianism? There's not even one term that Neo-Confucianism exactly renders in the Chinese. Not, as, not only is it not a direct translation of anything, but there's not really one term that precisely corresponds to it in every use. The closest term in Chinese, I think, is Daoxue, which refers, it, literally, it's like the study of the way or the learning of the way. Now, already you can see a problem because when you say Neo-Confucianism in English, like if you said that somebody was a neo-Platonist or a neo-conservative, what you would mean by saying somebody was a, for example, a neo-conservative is you'd say, well, they, they like some conservative doctrines, but they're defending them using ideas that would not have been used by earlier con uh, conservative thinkers. So they're updating conservatism for a contemporary audience. Or Neoplatonism is kind of a technical term in Western philosophy, referring in particular to the teachings of Plotinus. And people recognize that the teachings of Plotinus, although they're influenced by Plato, and certainly Plotinus thinks he's following Plato, they really develop Plato's ideas in new and distinctive ways. But if you look at the Chinese term that's closest, Daoshui, a learning of the way, there's no Neo here. So the Neo-Confucians, as we call them in English, didn't think that they were updating something or adapting something uh, in a way that changed its basic meaning. They simply thought they were studying and reviving the way that earlier thinkers like Confucius, and we'll see also Mengzi or Mencius had first developed. So they don't, the Neo-Confucians don't think they're Neo anything. They think they're just reviving the original way of the ancient masters. Other terms that people sometimes use for this movement is they'll talk about Li Xue, which is the learning of pattern. But more precisely, Li Xue is used as a term for a particular kind of learning of the way, that of the Cheng Ju school. And we'll talk about what that is in a later lecture. Other times people will use the phrase Xin Xue, learning of the mind. But again, that more precisely, that's a term to describe another sect or school within the Neo-Confucian movement, the Lu Wang school. In Chinese text, people will often use the phrase Song Ming Ru Xue, which means the Song and Ming dynasty Confucian learning. And that's a way of recognizing that there was something distinctive about the way that Confucianism developed in the Song and the Ming dynasty. The Song dynasty comes after the Tang dynasty, which is the period that you know, we've just been talking about. And the Ming dynasty is a later dynasty after that. But like I said, there's no one term in Chinese for this. The closest would probably be Daoshui, learning of the way. But people will also talk about Sung Ming Rushui, the Sung and Ming dynasty Confucian learning. And in the next few weeks, we'll be talking about what's distinctive about that particular movement. But, but broadly, what's distinctive about Confucianism in general, Han Yu's essay, On the Way, is very influential and really does give you a feel for what Confucianism in general is about. Han Yu begins on the way by saying, to love broadly is what is meant by benevolence. To act appropriately is what is meant by righteousness. To follow and move towards these, towards benevolence and righteousness, 
is what is meant by the way. To be sufficient in oneself without relying on the external is what is meant by virtue. So in other words, when you really have benevolence and righteousness in yourself, so you don't need to rely on others to make you act a certain way. You just have these character traits in yourself. That's what virtue is. So one of the things that is really characteristic of Confucianism is an emphasis on cultivating virtues. And as we're gonna see for Confucians, these virtues like benevolence and righteousness, these good character traits are things that manifest themselves in society. Virtues manifest themselves in the family. Virtues manifest themselves in how you contribute to the well-being of your community. Now, after this, Han Yu goes on to say, Benevolence and righteousness are fixed terms. The way and virtue are open concepts. Hence, there is the way of the gentleman and the petty person, and there is virtue that is unfortunate and that which is auspicious. Uh, I'm not gonna say too much about this, but it's a really interesting idea uh, to use a modern vocabulary, which is derived from an influential article by Martha Nussbaum, a philosopher at the University of Chicago, you, you might say that uh, Han Yu is saying that benevolence and righteousness are thick concepts in the sense they have a very specific meaning, whereas the way and virtue are thin concepts, meaning they have a kind of a, a general meaning and then different philosophers will fill in that meaning in different ways. The basic idea is what is the way? What is the right way to live and the right way to organize society? Well, Buddhists have one answer to what the way is. Confucians have a different answer to what the way is. Taoists have yet another answer. And given what the way is, what is it to be virtuous? Well, it depends on what you think the way is. So he's just pointing out the fact that the way these terms way and virtue are used depends on who's using them. But he claims anybody who uses benevolence and righteousness knows that these are what they are. And so benevolence generally speaking, is the virtue you have when you care about the well-being of others. The, when other people do well, it makes you happy. When other people suffer, that makes you sad. And you act appropriately on that compassion for others. Righteousness, Han Yu here says, it's to act appropriately is what is meant by righteousness. That is one of the classic definitions of righteousness. But another way you might think about it that becomes influential in the Confucian tradition is that righteousness is having an ethically informed sense of shame and being unwilling to do things like cheat on an exam or cheat in a sporting event or to lie to people to manipulate them for your own benefit. A righteous person would be ashamed to do things like that or to stand by while others do wrong. You know, you'd be ashamed to be that kind of person. And so a righteous person would be motivated to do what is right, even when there's a social cost for doing that, because they'd be ashamed to be the kind of person who stands by while others do wrong. So part of what's significant or uh, central to Confucianism is an emphasis on cultivating these socially responsive virtues. But Confucians think that there was a time when people learned about virtues like this from sages, but they gradually lost touch with that understanding. So Han Yu writes, in ancient times, people were harmed in many ways. Only when there were sages in place were people taught the way of nurturing one another. The sages made rulers for the people, made teachers for them, drove off vermin, snakes, and wild animals, and made them dwellings in the central plains. They were cold, and so the sages taught them to make clothing. They were hungry, and so the sages taught them to make food. In general, whenever anything harmful came, the sages instituted preparations against it. Whenever problems developed, the sages instituted defenses against them. Yet nowadays, there is a doctrine, if sages do not die, great thievery will not stop cut up the official measure and break the scales and the people will cease to fight. Alas, right? and this is a 
what's in quotations there is a Taoist saying, saying, you know, we were better off before we had the sages. We were better off before we had civilization. Now, th this gives us a particular vision of how civilization and culture develop in response to the agency of these sages, these extremely wise and extremely virtuous individuals. You, you might not like that particular view of history, but the general perspective here is that people's lives have improved as the result of culture and government. That doesn't mean that everything that is called culture or literature or civilization is good. It doesn't mean that everything that's called government or that is done in the name of government is good. But what it means is that humans are the kind of creatures who need to live in a community and some ways of organizing a community are better than others. And we should value the genuine contributions of civilization that have allowed us to find better ways of living together as social animals. That's the basic Confucian view. But sadly, the way of the Zhou dynasty declined. Kungza passed away. So there's this vision that at the beginning of the Zhou dynasty, you know, which is one of the three earliest Chinese dynasties, you had these sage kings who instituted good forms of government, governing for the benefit of the common people with virtue and wisdom. But gradually, the dynasty declined. And Kungza lived during a time of social chaos and cultural decay, but he understood the wisdom of the past and he tried to preserve it and pass it on to later generations, but eventually even he passed away. Then there was the Qin dynasty burning of books. Remember the Qin dynasty unified China under the first emperor, Qin Shi Huangdi. But among the things that he did was persecute, supposedly persecute Confucian scholars and burn books uh, of philosophy, including Confucian texts. Then there was the Huang Lao Taoism of the Han Dynasty. So Taoism became an organized religion in the Han Dynasty. Taoism as a religion is sometimes called Huang Lao Taoism, and it was influential in the Han. There was Buddhism during the Six Dynasties period and the Sui Dynasty. The Sui Dynasty was the brief dynasty before the Tang Dynasty. And as I pointed out, Buddhism really grew and developed in popularity during the Six Dynasties period. When doctrines regarding the way, virtue, benevolence, and righteousness did not tend toward Yangism, then they tended toward Moism. Or if they did not tend toward Taoism, then they tended toward Buddhism. This is a really important and influential line. What is Han Yu talking about here? The ancient Confucian philosopher Mengzi said, the words of Yangju and Mozi fill the air. If people don't lead to, lean toward the doctrines of Yangju, then they lean towards the doctrines of Mozi. To believe in the teachings of Yangju is to be, uh, is to reject your ruler, to lean towards the teachings of Muadza, is to reject your own parents. What does he mean by that? Yangju was an ancient philosopher who seems to have advocated, or at least he was interpreted as advocating a form of egoism, particularly what we philosophers now call ethical egoism. Ethical egoism is the doctrine that the only thing you have any good reason to do, the only thing that you really ought to do is what will benefit you as an individual. So as people used to say in the 70s, look out for number one and you're number one. So look out just for yourself, be totally selfish and that's actually the right thing to do. That's what Young Jews teaching was supposed to be. Mozza taught impartial caring. He said that the right way to live is to care impartially for everybody, regardless of whether this person is a member of your family or a stranger, whether they're a member of your community or a foreigner, uh, whether they're somebody you know well or don't know at all, impartially care for everybody. And Mengzi, as a Confucian, rejected both these extremes. He said you should not be completely selfish the way Yangju advocates, 
But you also shouldn't have completely impartial concern for others the way Mozza does, because it's both natural and ethically appropriate to care more for and to have greater ethical obligations for your own friends and family than you do for complete strangers. So that's what Mengzi said in ancient China. But what happens with Neo-Confucians, and we see it starting here with Han Yu, is they say, okay, Yang Ju's teaching is a lot like the teaching of Taoism, and Mozi's teaching is a lot like the teachings of the Buddhists. So Mengzi's rejection of the teachings of Yang Ju and the teachings of Mozi is like the way that we contemporary Confucians should reject both Taoism and Buddhism. Now, why did people like Han Yu think that Taoism was like the selfishness of Yang Ju? Because, and this isn't what I think the earliest Taoist philosophers like Lao Tzu and Zhuang Tzu themselves taught, but what the Taoist religion, Huang Lao Taoism, became in the Han and later dynasties, a lot of it was associated with practices and potions, elixirs, that would help you to achieve immortality. The quest for immortality was an important part of Taoist practice as a religion. And in fairness, people would sometimes, uh, you see this in the classic Chinese novel, Dream of the Red Chamber, where in the beginning, we're following this wealthy influential family and we learn that the patriarch, the oldest male in the household, isn't living in the household. He's living in a, a Taoist temple. And even when one of his relatives dies, he refuses to come back for the funeral because he says that would make me ritually impure. I must purify myself by my Taoist practices. So, in fairness, again, maybe not, I don't think it is the highest teachings of what Taoism as a philosophy is about, but what Taoist practice often became was a quest for individual immortality. And the Confucians said, that's selfish. Leaving society behind so you can achieve individual immortality, that's selfish. That's really, at its root, what Yang Ju was talking about, its selfishness. Mozi advocated impartial caring. And Confucians certainly think you should have some compassion for everyone, but they think that filial piety is an important part of virtue, caring more for family members and friends and people who are part of your life than complete strangers, that is part of being a good person. Whereas Mozi advocated impartial caring, that struck Confucians like Han Yu as similar to the universal compassion that Buddhism advocated. So Buddhism advocates universal compassion, and people like Han Yu said, yeah, that's really just like the Moist, and that's too extreme of a position because it ignores things like filial piety and your obligations to your friends and your family. So Han Yu continues, nowadays people desire to correct their minds, but treat as external the world and the state extinguishing heaven-given universals, like respect for your parents and love for your own children and having a family and caring for your own body and enjoying a good meal and romantic love. Someone is a son, but he does not treat his father as a father. Someone is a minister, a government minister, but he does not treat his ruler as a ruler. Someone is one of the common people, but he does not treat his duties as duties. So, this gives you like a, a general sense of what Confucianism is about and what it sees as problematic with Buddhism on multiple levels. Before we leave Han Yu's essay, I'm going to mention one last thing he says. He says in passing, in the summer, one wears light clothes. In the winter, one wears heavy clothes. When thirsty, one drinks. And when hungry, one eats. The activities differ, but that by which they are wise is one. Yet nowadays there is the saying, why not practice the no activity of high antiquity? That's a reference to, to Taoism, particularly Huang Lao Taoism. This is like challenging those who wear heavy clothes in winter saying, why not wear light clothes? They're easier to wear. Or like challenging those who eat when they are hungry saying, why not drink? It's easier. 
It's just a passing comment, and it might not be clear why it's so important, but we're going to see later in the course that Zhang Xuecheng, who's a fascinating philosopher in a much later era, was really interested in this essay by Han Yu. But what struck him about it is the vision we get in Han Yu's On the Way of society as evolving over time and the actions of the sages as responding to the needs of individuals on particular occasions. So for example, this is a true story. I have a colleague, uh, I believe he was at uh, Beida, Peking University, and he actually tried to get funding for a proposal to recreate a traditional Confucian community in contemporary China where people would speak classical Chinese on a day-to-day -day basis, not modern vernacular Chinese, but classical Chinese. People would dress in the style of ancient Confucians. They would perform ancient Confucian rituals. And I asked him, well, you certainly you wouldn't recreate everything. So for example, Confucian scholars used to have a wife and multiple concubines. You wouldn't recreate that. And he said, oh, yes, I would. We're going to have concubines for sure. So Han Yu or Zhang Xuecheng, this later philosopher who was influenced by Han Yu would say, look, uh, that's not taking into account the way in which wisdom has to be responsive to the historical context that you're in. And you can't just reproduce the way things were in the past, you have to respond to the present. Or at least that's the way Zhang Xuecheng would later interpret what Han Yu had said in On the Way. But it's, it's just an, it's not a fully developed idea and on the way, but the, the hint that Confucianism needs to evolve with time is there in on the way and it's developed by Zhang Xuecheng later. We'll get to that later in the course though. So among the key doctrines of Confucianism overall are culture and government have been beneficial to humans. Culture and government were created and are maintained by ethically cultivated individuals. And in ethically cultivated individuals are ones who have virtues like benevolence and righteousness that manifest themselves in the family and in the community. Genuine virtues like benevolence and righteousness are manifested in serving others, humans and society. Benevolence and righteousness are cultivated through a study of the Confucian classics. And remember, we saw in an earlier lecture that the five classics, the Wu Jing, were central to Confucian education beginning in the Han Dynasty. We'll see in the next few weeks that other texts, including the Analects of Confucius, the Mengzi, the sayings of this later Confucian Mengzi, the Great Learning and the Mean, will start to become more influential than they had been in the past. And Confucian's claim, in contrast to Confucianism, Buddhism encourages people to abandon culture, to flee society, and become, become unproductive parasites on society. So in a nutshell, these are the key doctrines of, of Confucianism. Now, as we saw before, some of the objections that like, people like Han Yu raise are just matters of xenophobia or ethnocentrism. Some objections are legitimate objections to what Buddhist practice had become and what the institution of Buddhism had become by the end of the Han dynasties, which in some ways are corrupt and maybe lost touch with the true spirit of Buddhism. But there were also, also some more subtle philosophical critiques of Buddhism. In the last uh, part of this talk, I want to lay out some of these more subtle philosophical critiques that Confucians raise of Buddhism. Now, a philosopher we're going to be looking at more later in the course is Lu Shangshan, and I asked you for today to read his letter to his friend Wang Shunbo. And one of the things Lu Shangshan says in this letter is he says, in your last two letters to my elder brother, your overall point was that Confucianism and Buddhism were the same. And then if we compare them point by point, we will find that they are, as they say, equal in every regard. But I, have, but I Lu Shangshan, have used the two words righteousness and profit to differentiate Confucianism from Buddhism. 
But I have also, I have also used the words public mindedness and selfishness. But what I really have in mind with those terms is the distinction between righteousness and profit. So there were, there always have been people in China who said that when you understand them at their deepest level, the teachings of Confucianism, Taoism, and Buddhism, the three teachings of traditional China are ultimately consistent with one another. But there have also been sectarian disputes between Confucians, Buddhists, and Taoists. We saw the great anti-Buddhist persecution was instigated by Taoists. We've seen that Han Yu identified a lot of social problems uh, as having their source in Buddhist teachings and Buddhist practices. And Lu Shangshan, likewise, he's talking to a friend, Wang Shunbo, who says, well, look, ultimately, Buddhism and Confucianism are consistent. Lu Shangshan will have none of it. He says, no. Confucianism is characterized by righteousness and public mindedness. Buddhism is concerned with the pursuit of profit and selfishness. And this is the major difference between the two. He goes on to say, because Confucians are concerned only with righteousness and the public good, they seek to put the world into good order. Because Buddhists are concerned only with profit and selfish good, they seek to flee the world completely. Although Confucian teachings talk about what is without sound or scent and has no definitive place and no definitive form, and these are phrases that you can find in uh, some Confucian classics, the Confucians' guiding aim always is to put the world into good order. Although Buddhist teachings do sometimes talk about saving all sentient creatures, even those yet to be born, their guiding aim always is to flee the world completely. So Lu Shangshan is framing the deep philosophical disagreement between Confucians and Buddhists over whether or not you want to just benefit yourself have help yourself to escape the suffering from the world or help everyone to escape the suffering of the world. Now, bonus points if you remember that this distinction between are you just trying to save yourself from suffering or are you trying to save the world from suffering, that's the distinction that the Mahayana Buddhists made when they criticized Theravadan Buddhism or as they called it dismissively, Hinayana Buddhism, right? So the, you see this in several Mahayana Buddhist texts. They'll say, we Mahayana Buddhists have as our ethical ideal, the Bodhisattva. A Bodhisattva is an enlightened being and because they're enlightened, they want to eliminate the suffering of all sentient creatures, promote the happiness of all sentient creatures. Whereas the Mahayana Buddhists said, the Theravadan Buddhists, or as they call them, the Hinayana, the lesser vehicle Buddhists, their ideal is just the Arhat, the person who achieves enlightenment, but just to end their own suffering. And the Mahayana Buddhists said, the ideal of Theravadan Buddhism is ultimately selfish because they're trying to end suffering for themselves, whereas our Mahayana ideal is more public spirited because we wanna end suffering for everybody. So the irony here is that this becomes a common Confucian criticism of Buddhism, that the Buddhists are selfish because they only wanna end suffering for themselves, whereas we Confucians are more generous and benevolent because we wanna end suffering for everybody. Ironically, that was precisely the objection the Mahayana Buddhists made to the Theravadan Buddhists. And I suggested when we first looked at the difference between Mahayana and Theravada that this was probably unfair to Theravada Buddhists, but it is the way they frame the dispute. So it's interesting that the Confucians ironically pick up this Buddhist idea. And we'll see that on, on many topics, and this is one of the main themes I hope you'll get in the course, the Neo-Confucians, although they don't think they're Neo-anything, they think they're just reviving the way, Tao Shui, they're learning or studying the way of the ancients. They've been influenced by Buddhist ideas so much that the Neo-Confucians pick up and use in their philosophy lots of concepts and philosophical moves that they get from Buddhism. 
And that's why to understand this movement, you really need to learn about Buddhism and in particular Chinese Buddhism first, because the neo-Confucian formulation of, Buddh of Confucianism only makes sense against the background of Buddhism. And to help illustrate that, consider this next work. This is one of my favorite works in the Confucian tradition, the Western inscription. Um, I used to have this on my office door. Post pandemic, I'll have to put it up again. I just moved offices. But in my new office, I'll have to put this on, a version of this on the door, the Western inscription. It's really beautiful. And this was written by this later Confucian philosopher, Zhang Zai. And he wrote it up in calligraphy and he plastered it on the Western wall of his study to inspire him. And other people copied it and it became one of the basic expressions of Confucian ethics. Heaven is the father, earth is the mother. And I, this tiny thing, dwell enfolded in them. Hence, what fills heaven and earth is my body and what rules heaven and earth is my nature. The people are my siblings and all living things are my companions. My ruler is the eldest son of my parents and his ministers are his retainers. To respect those great in years is the way to treat your elders as elders. To be kind to the orphan and the weak is to treat your young ones as young ones. These are phrases from Mengzi, that ancient Confucian philosopher. Uh, that I mentioned before, who becomes increasingly influential uh, his ideas are revived and become very influential in the Neo-Confucian movement. At one point he said, treat your elders as elders and extend it to the elders of other families. Treat your young ones as young ones and extend it to the young ones of other families. In other words, learn to respect the elders in your family and from there extend that to respecting other people's elders. When I run across an older person I often remind myself, I think, okay, this is an older person. This person could be my mother or father, and I should treat them with all the kindness appropriate to my own mother or father. And when I run into children, I think, okay, these children aren't my children, but they could be my children. And I should treat them with the compassion and concern and patience that I would treat my own children. So it's really inspiring kind of image of what the ethical life is like, and it continues all under heaven who are tired, crippled, exhausted, sick, brotherless, childless, widows or widowers, all are my siblings who are helpless and have no one else to appeal to. To care for them at such times is the practice of a good son. To be delighted and without care because trusting them, meaning heaven and earth, is the purest filial piety. To defy them, to defy heaven and earth, is to rebel against virtue. Riches, honor, good fortune, and abundance, when I get them, all shall enrich my life. But poverty, humble station, distress, and sorrow, if I get those, shall lovingly guide me to completion. So I'll learn lessons from poverty, humble station, distress, and sorrow. Living, I serve them compliantly. Dead, I shall be at peace. Beautiful, beautiful expression of a kind of uh, compassion for everyone grounded in an identification of oneself with the universe, really inspiring. It's a Confucian document. But if you've been paying attention to the, the Buddhist teachings in the course and the notion that one is all and all is one, doesn't this sound a lot like something a Buddhist would say? The notion that I should care for everyone and everything because I'm one with everything else. I should have compassion for all young people because they are my children. I should have compassion for all older people because they are all my parents. I should have compassion for any human I encounter because they're my sibling, my brother or sister. It's inspiring vision, sounds a lot like Buddhism. And honestly, I think, I don't think an ancient Confucian would say this, but Neo-Confucians say things like this all the time. So aren't Confucians, the Neo-Confucians in particular, although they're critics of Buddhism, aren't they really just Buddhists in Confucian clothing? This was an issue 
that Confucians address. And this is the point of Cheng Yi's reply to Yang Shi's letter on the Western inscription. And Cheng Yi was a major figure, he and his brother Cheng Hao were major figures in developing what became mature philosophical Neo-Confucianism. And his friend Yang Shi wrote Cheng Yi and said, you know, I'm kind of concerned. I, I like the Western inscription and all, but isn't it really a Buddhist work? Is it really a Confucian work? It sounds so much like Buddhism. Cheng Yi replies, while it is true that Zhang Tsai at times is mistaken in what he says, for example, in places in his correcting youthful ignorance, as a work, the Western inscription explains how to extend pattern to preserve righteousness. And in this respect, expands upon themes earlier sages had yet to address. It is equal in merit to Mengzi's discussion of the goodness of human nature and how to cultivate one's chi. These two also are themes earlier sages had yet to address. How can you equate it with the writings of Mengzi? So notice we learned several things here. First, apparently Yang Shur said, look, the Western inscription sounds like a Buddhist work. Indeed, it sounds like Mordza's doctrine of impartial caring, which we Confucians reject. But Cheng Yi is defending it, saying, no, 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 this is a really insightful work, and it teaches us how to extend pattern to preserve righteousness. Pattern is this term li that we've seen in Buddhist discussions, particularly in Hua Yan Buddhism. Remember the image of Indra's web or Indra's net, which is an image of how everything in the universe is interconnected. Just like each jewel in Indra's web reflects every other jewel, so does every dharma in the universe reflect every other dharma. And the pattern of connections among the dharma, the Hua Yan Buddhists refer to as Li, which we render in English as pattern. The Neo-Confucians like Cheng Yi, Cheng Hao, Zhang Zai, they pick up this Buddhist term and they use it themselves. So Cheng Yi is defending it and he's saying, well, no, no, Zhang Zai uh, doesn't sound like a Buddhist. He doesn't sound like Mordza. Why not? He says the Western inscription clearly explains that pattern is one, but its manifestations are many. Li Yi, Fan Shu. And this becomes one of the central doctrines of the Neo-Confucian tradition, that pattern is one, which is what the Hua Yan Buddhists had said. But, Cheng Yi says, what the Buddhists didn't get is the manifestations of pattern are many. Cheng Yi goes on to explain a confusion that can occur when making distinctions of degree in one's affection is that they can lead to selfishness winning out and thereby failing to attain benevolence. What he means is you fail to attain benevolence if you don't recognize that the pattern is one. It's one pattern that unites me with the cat who's sitting right underneath the camera here, that unites me with you. Because as a teacher, I'm only a teacher because you're a student. And I'm only a human because you are also a human. And so you need to recognize the pattern is one. But the error in having no distinctions in the manifestations is that one will practice impartial care and thereby lack righteousness. So the other mistake is while recognizing the pattern is one, failing to recognize that its manifestations are many. And that's the mistake that Mordza and the Buddhists make, failing to recognize that the manifestations of pattern are many. To clearly establish distinct manifestations and to extend the unity of the pattern in order to prevent the tendency to let selfishness win out is the method of benevolence. But to be without distinctions and be misled by impartial care to the point where one will have no father, which was what Mengzi said about the Moists, is to do violence to righteousness. For you to equate these things is quite a mistake. So he says, no, if you read the Western inscription carefully, it recognizes the pattern is one, but its manifestations are many. That phrase never occurs in the Western inscription, but Cheng Yi knows that, but he says that's really the teaching that, is, uh, that underlies what uh, Zhang Tsai is saying, and it's different from the Buddhist teachings. So in summary, the Confucians say that the egoism 
of the ancient thinker Yang Ju and his movement Yangism is analogous to the selfishness of contemporary Taoists who follow Lao Tzu because they're just trying to achieve immortality. The impartial care advocated by Muadza is like the universal compassion advocated by the Buddhists. They're, each of these is an extreme position. We Confucians have a moderate position. The Confucian criticism of Buddhism, ironically, is very similar to the Mahayana criticism of Theravada, or as they call it, Hinayana Buddhism. Specifically, the Mahayana Buddhists advocate the ideal of the Bodhisattva, and they contrast this with the ideal of the selfish Arhat. And that's a lot like the Confucian criticism of Buddhism. I'm not sure I spelled those correctly on the slide. Sorry about that. And as a way of putting this really simply, the Confucians will say that, well, the thing that we Confucians get, that the Buddhists don't get, is that pattern is one, but its manifestations are many. And that's how the Confucians hold on to both the notion that pattern is one and we're all unified by the pattern, but because the manifestations of the pattern are many, therefore there really are things like my obligation of filial piety to my parents. All right, so today we looked at the decline of Buddhism in the Tang, ending in the great persecution of Buddhism at the end of Tang, from which Buddhism, uh, the, the, the persecution of Buddhism at the end of the Tang, from which Buddhism never fully recovered, although it continued to exist, but it never regained the heights of philosophical development and social cachet and prestige. Then the Neo-Confucian movement, as we call it in English, developed in response to that. And then we looked at some of the more, some of the objections the Neo-Confucians raise are just ethnocentric. Some of them are legitimate concerns about what Buddhism had become institutionally. And some of them are very subtle objections to, to Buddhism as a movement. Although ironically, they often parallel objections that Mahayana Buddhists would raise towards Theravada Buddhists. Next week, we'll look at the specific form that Confucianism took and how they tried to combine this notion of pattern, which they'd gotten from Huayan Buddhism, with the notion of qi to explain what it really means to say the pattern is one, but its manifestations are many. Thanks, and I'll see you next time.